This video explores Le Chatelier's principle, which has a look at what happens to chemical equilibria when they experience uh, stress, which can be defined as uh, something that changes the concentration of one of the chemicals, uh, what would happen if the volume of the system changes, creating a pressure change, uh, or if you heat up or cool down the system, causing a temperature change. Generally speaking, the idea is that when you stress a uh, chemical equilibrium, there will be a response in the system that will offset the stress. So by and large, anytime that you add something into the system, the system will shift in such a way to use that up. If you remove something from the system, the system will shift in a way that will replace what you took out. So for all of the examples, we're going to be having a look at the equilibrium listed at the bottom which is an exothermic reaction causing nitrogen and hydrogen to react together, uh, producing ammonia. And we know that it's exothermic for the fact that energy is a term on the product side. So the first uh, look that we're going to have here is what would happen with changes of concentration. So we know that the system uh, by the graph right now is at equilibrium because the concentrations are unchanged over the course of time. Now, let's say that a stress is imposed on the system, and what would happen is that we have an immediate increase in the concentration of nitrogen. So because equilibria happen in closed systems, what we would have to do is maybe have an injection port of some sort, take an amount of nitrogen gas, and insert it sort of in one shot into the system. This would cause the particles of nitrogen to increase, but the volume to stay the same. So just the concentration of nitrogen in that system would jump immediately. And the question would be, well, what would happen as a result? Well, since the idea is that we've increased the concentration of nitrogen immediately in the system, the system will shift in such a way to use up what you've uh, had. So some of that nitrogen is going to gather get together with some of the hydrogen that's already in the system and those will react in such a way as to produce some more ammonia um, during this uh, sort of shifting process. So as a result of that immediate increase in nitrogen, the response is going to be that we will use up some nitrogen and hydrogen and create some ammonia in the process. And generally speaking, this is what the graph would, would look like, maybe exaggerated to a certain extent, but by and large, that's what you would see. How do we know that that has actually taken place? Well, if you have a look at the shapes of the red and the blue curves, uh, immediately after the stress, which would take place here on the graph, then you'll notice that um, we can tell that their concentrations are decreasing after the stress, because both of those curves trend downward. And while we use up some of the nitrogen and hydrogen, ammonia is being produced, and we can see that by the curve going upward in the ammonia curve. So another example of uh, concentration stress, in this case, a decrease. So here again, we have a system at equilibrium. And now let's say that we take out some ammonia. Now, gaseous systems, this would be kind of hard to do. In fact, in most homogeneous systems, this is a tough ask, but we could initiate some kind of a side reaction, for example, that could remove something out of uh, the system in terms of lowering its concentration. So something has occurred to lower the concentration of ammonia. And now, because this concentration has decreased, the system will shift in such a way to replace what you've taken away. So the system will shift towards the product. And uh, as a result, we will use up some nitrogen and hydrogen to produce some more ammonia, replacing what we took out in the first place. So graphically, what's going to happen then is we will see some nitrogen and hydrogen being taken out, as seen by the curves going downward. We will see some ammonia being replaced. And generally speaking, it reestablishes an equilibrium at some point here. 
Now, in both of these two examples, one thing that's very important to note is that the KC value at this position is going to be identical to the KC value at this position. And even though graphically, you know, there might be an exaggeration to um, the shapes of the curves just for demonstration purposes, um, we need to identify that the KC value is being upheld from the one condition to the other. Uh, this can be tested empirically, it goes a little beyond what we have to worry about for, for this course. Uh, later on, there will be a, a situation where the KC value will change, and we'll talk about that shortly. So now let's have a look at the way to create a pressure change. And by and large, we do that by actually changing the volume of the system. So let's say that the uh, system is in a flexible container, like a piston. And what that means is that you can actually draw the piston open or closed to change the volume. So now we have our system at equilibrium. And let's say that we depress the piston so that the volume decreases. Well, all of the moles of the gases, so nitrogen, hydrogen, and ammonia, that are trapped in that cylinder stay the same at the moment of the change. But the volume decreases, so the ratio of the moles of each gas to the volume creates an increase in the concentration in each case. So when you see a graph where it looks like everything is jumping all immediately upward or downward, that is a strong hint that you've gone through a, a volume change, creating a change in pressure. So now, remembering that pressure, especially dealing with gases, is due to the uh, collisions of the gases with the size of the container, when you decrease the volume, you're going to increase the amount of collisions that you have over time. So the result of decreasing the volume is also to increase the pressure. Now, to resolve a pressure change, what we need to do is decrease the number of collisions, really, at the end of the day. The question might be, how do we do that? What we have to do is tally the number of moles of gases on both the reactant side and the product side. So we add those together and we see that there are four total moles of reactant gas and two total moles of product gas. So we can offset this pressure increase by creating more ammonia, by shifting to the right or to the product side. And the reason why that works is because if you use up four particles of reactant, which would be the nitrogen and the hydrogen, to create two particles of ammonia, the number of particles floating around in that container every time that you do that uh, lowers, reducing the number of particles that are moving and bouncing off the sides of the container. Okay? And that is an effective way of reducing the pressure in that system. The result on the graph is going to look like this. And again, perhaps slightly exaggerated, but you'll notice that immediately at the point of stress, which is here, we have jump in the concentrations due to the decrease in volume. And then, because there is a simultaneous increase in pressure, there is a shift to the product side, causing an increase in the amount of ammonia and a proportional decrease in the amount of nitrogen and hydrogen that will relieve the added pressure in the system by shifting to the side with the least moles of gas. At this point, we're going to have a look at the effect of changing the temperature on a system. And in this case, an important consideration to make is the impact that a temperature change has on the value of Kc. Uh, and that's an important consideration because we're not going to have sudden changes of concentrations uh, during our stress. In this instance, we're going to have a cooling of the system, which essentially means that we are removing energy from the system. So technically, because energy is a product in the system, we are decreasing this component of the equilibrium. 
and the system will shift in such a way as to replace what you've taken out. So we will get a shift to the product side in this case in order to offset what we've removed. Now, the consequence of that is that we will use up some nitrogen and hydrogen in order to produce some of the energy back that uh, we took away. But in the process, we are also making more ammonia. So immediately at the point of stress, which is usual is gonna be here, we're actually not going to see any sudden jumps up or down because we're not changing the concentration of a chemical measurably in terms of its concentration. We are now affecting energy, which is not being graphed. So we have a look at what happens. And as a result of cooling the system, to replace the energy that we took away, we are going to use up some nitrogen and hydrogen, and that will create some ammonia in the process while also adding back some of the energy that we took away. Now, as mentioned, there is something here that happens to the value Kc, and what we can do is have a comparison between Kc, I'll call it initial, and then Kc final, and try to figure out what has actually happened here. Now, because Kc is described as products over reactants, we can really have a look at this expression and ask the question, from before till after, while we go through this stress, what is the impact on this ratio? Well, if you have a look, we seem to have increased the amount of product and decreased the amount of reactant. And so if you resolve that ratio, the value of Kc is actually going to increase. So one way of saying that is that the Kc at the cooler temperature is going to be larger than that of the higher temperature, or more importantly, that the value of Kc increases due to this stress. Okay, so that would be looking at it one way. You could probably guess that this is all going to be reversed for heating, and that's going to be true. Uh, but to be overt about it, we have a system here that uh, is at equilibrium, and then at the point of stress, and that's going to be here, uh, we are going to heat the system immediately. And then we have an abundance of the energy in the system. We want to use up the extra energy, so we will get rid of that energy by also reacting it with the ammonia. And the result is that we are going to produce additional nitrogen and hydrogen uh, in that process. So this will be the resulting graph. And you can see that the ammonia goes down, nitrogen and hydrogen both go up as a result or a consequence of heating this system. Now, again, we can have a look at the Kc in this position and the Kc in this position. And I won't quite go through the same amount of detail as I had on the previous slide. But hopefully you can see that as a result of the product decreasing in concentration and the reactants increasing in concentration, the ratio representing Kc is going to have a smaller value finally than it did initially. Or we could also say that the Kc value decreases. Okay, an important consideration to make though is that anytime that we are uh, stressing a system one way or the other, so whether by changing a concentration, changing the volume, or adding energy, uh, any of these stresses happen to the system. And your job as a chemist is to look at the equation and ask, what is the impact of this stress? Uh, very often, it's common for students to see that a, a stress occurs where something is added. And just because of a common understanding of how reactions go, any time you add something, it seems to affect a reactant. But you'll notice that I've been very selective about where I choose to look at the impact of what I'm adding or taking away. So really at the end of the day, a very important consideration to make is when you do a, a stress, you're stressing the system. And you have to ask yourself, what is the impact to the system by adding or removing this thing? 
One last thing that you can add or remove to a system is a catalyst. And in fact, a catalyst is something that if added to a system would actually not create a stress or it would be a stress to the system, but it wouldn't cause the system to shift in any way. What a catalyst does is it increases both the rates of the forward and reverse reaction equally. But if the system is already at equilibrium, there will be no visible change to the concentrations because ultimately the rates at which the forward and reverse reaction occur uh, might change, uh, might increase due to the catalyst, but they increase proportionately to each other. So there would be no impact on the concentrations in a system. So there's a summary of Le Chatelier's principle, and I hope you've enjoyed the video.